Okay, we got three playoff games tonight to talk about. Mavs Clippers is now 1-1, Suns Wolves is 2-0, and Pacers Bucks is 1-1. We are going to start with uh, the title and thumbnail with Mavs Clippers, and uh, my takeaways from this game are, I have no idea what's going to happen moving forward in the series. For one, just how is Kawhi going to look? Because clearly, Kawhi, not 100%. The next question being the Clippers and their trapping Luka, putting two to the ball on Luka, especially on pick and rolls, and then how Dallas deals with that. Because in this game, what we saw was eventually they moved Luka to the post for a couple plays there where they had Kyrie one pass away. One time Luka got a back down on Harden. He drew a foul. Harden disagreed. Okay. Another time, Russ helped on the post up right to Kyrie. That's a three. Before that, we saw a number of plays where it's two to the ball on Luka, and then whether it's like Lively or Kleba left open in the middle of the floor, whether it's like P.J. Washington being left open in the corner, whether it was just kind of anybody besides Kyrie or Luka left open, and you know, the results were a little mixed. Now, later in the game, we did get Kleba making a three, P.J. Washington made at least one three, he uh, went one time off the dribble, and he kind of had Kawhi all over him, but he made a floater, Um, but there was a stretch there in the third where... I mean, you had, like, Maxi Kleba stripped by Russ in the middle of the floor. You had one time where Gafford was on the roll with two to the ball on Luka. Kawhi made a great defensive rotation to contest Gafford at the rim, and it wasn't a foul, so, you know, good defensive play. Now, there was that one where Kyrie had that insane behind-the-back pass where Luka, like, he got the swing thing going, and then it was that behind-the-back pass to PJ. I was like, oh, my God, Kyrie. But yeah, it's just, you know, how often is Luka in the post moving forward versus how often is he running screens up top? Where is Kyrie in relation to him? Is he one pass away? Is he like two passes away? Because I think, well, of course that matters. I mean, we also had a play where Luka attacked off the catch. Like he was on the wing, but Kyrie had the ball at the top of the key. And so Kyrie threw it to him with like the whole side of the floor to Luka with Russ guarding him. And Luka immediately attacks off the catch, gets inside. And I think he found PJ for a good shot that went in. So like, just how much variety can the Mavs continue to have with their offense besides Luka, Kyrie, Isos, Luka or Kyrie screen actions up top and, you know, of course, just the other guys making the plays and all that. As far as the other side of the floor, hey, listen, like I said, Kawhi was clearly not 100%. Uh, game one, the Ma- the Clippers shoot 50% from three and game two, they shoot 27%. Although I do remember that one time the Mavs left Russ wide open and he made that one. And Russ, I mean, you know, Russ's energy is always going to be there. Um, It did feel like the Mavs were decently aggressive with, like, throwing extra bodies into the paint on the Clippers and then trusting that they could get closeouts. Like, there's one play where, like, Harden, like, Luka denies Harden the screen, and then it's like a kick out to Kawhi on the other side of the floor, and Kyrie closes out to him. That's, like, that's like the one play that sticks out of my head there. But, yeah, I mean, the Clippers offense, definitely not a game to write home about. Um, it, it did feel like just general motion, extra action things were not happening probably as much as you'd like them to. I do remember two plays in the fourth there, one where PG's just trying to ISO on Luka. He gets the switch, and it's a three that, like, I mean, we've seen PG make before, but okay, shot didn't go in, not really much ball movement. Another time where it was effectively the same thing with Kawhi trying to score over Luka, again, on a switch. That one was, I, I believe, just, it was just a 15-footer. Like, it's a, again, it's a shot Kawhi's made a million times, but, uh, you know, not as much movement as you'd love to see all the time so yeah but look I'm not gonna make any grand declarations about how this series is gonna go yeah the Mavericks were my prediction but like I got no clue Uh, of course Kawhi's health biggest thing Uh, I think we can now go on to the Suns and the Wolves where it is now a 2-0 series Suns looked bad again and yes I picked Phoenix to win in six games and like I said in game one my biggest fear with the Wolves was their offense it was the turnovers it was the way that the Suns threw extra bodies at Ant in the regular season and the way that he was not able to uh, be that good in the regular season versus them. In this game, man, Ant shot 3 for 12 from the field, and I swear he was still a massive positive for the Wolves. He had 8 assists, and I swear to you, he probably had, I don't know, at least 10 other plays where he created the swing offense that led to a good shot or a foul for somebody. Very simple things like he runs a screen action up top, KD helps out just a little bit off a of cat, Ant, quick flip over to Cat. He drives straight line, draws a foul on KD. Not an assist, but that's a good play. Similarly, like a play where they've got two to the ball on him. I don't remember who exactly it was, but it could have been Book, could have been KD, Beal, Royce, Grayson before he went down, Gordon, Book, whoever. Um, it's like a little swing to Nas Reed, nothing too crazy. Swing to him, which then becomes a skip to Jaden McDaniels, who then takes it off the dribble himself, and it's a drive and a kick to Nikhil Alexander-Walker, who then attacks off the catch himself, which then becomes Rudy underneath the basket getting a dunk. 
Once again, Ant's not getting the assist, but he's the one who began the whole process. A play where you had Alexander Walker kind of ghost screen, like doing something out of the Pacers playbook for Ant to get in the middle of the floor. He then drives right at Nurkic, and then that's a pass to Rudy for a dunk. Of course, Jaden got a couple of his uh, threes or catches off the drive, or drives off the catch, that was backwards, uh, or like a pull-up two over KD, that was great. I mean, this is like one of the best games of Jaden McDaniel's career. Similar thing with Alexander Walker. We had Conley making like a pull-up three off of a screen. You had a couple plays where like Ant would flip it to Conley and they're immediately flowing into the Conley Gobert two-man action. And uh, let's talk about Rudy and his defense because, man, we had switches onto Beal and Book is what it felt like the most in this one. And he was just locking it up every single time he did it. And I remember in my series preview, I said when it came to Rudy switching, I said Gobert is an underrated perimeter defender and he can switch. My question was more so, what happens if you do that and then Gobert is outside of the paint? So even if he does his job well, what happens to the back line of your defense because, you know, he's out on the perimeter now? Well, in this game, I mean, they just kept trying to challenge him in one-on-ones and he was great at locking those up. So we'll see if they try something different if they get the switch in game three. The other thing, too, is that the Suns shot 22 threes. They shot even less threes than they did in game one where they shot like 28, I believe. And I think similar to game one, it's the Wolves. I mean, now Grayson Allen did get hurt, and obviously he takes threes for them. I don't want to act like that doesn't matter. I don't think that's the difference between them winning or losing, but like, okay, Grayson Allen matters for the Suns, no doubt. But I do think the Wolves are really trying to not put their defense in super heavy rotation, so it's more switching. You know, it's, you know, Rudy's dropping on the screen, or he's starting up high, then he's backing up, and the screen navigation like it was in game one is very good in this game. And they're not going super duper heavy rotations out of the corners and all that stuff. Anyway, that, all that to say that combine that with the Suns, already not being a heavy three-point shooting team, like 22 threes is just too damn low. Unless you are the Denver Nuggets and you have the ability to get a shot in the paint by the best player in the NBA whenever you want to. The Suns do not have that luxury. So anyway, they got to win game three. I will say that there was one little play that happened in this game where Nurkic had the ball around, I want to say, a little above the free throw line and Gobert was playing close to him and they got a cut action off of that and Rudy wasn't able to just swat it away. I was like, okay, that's a little interesting. Didn't feel like it happened a whole lot more the rest of the game, unless I'm just dumb, which it's possible. Uh, They also did get a couple of uh, double screen actions where, like, Book would screen Gobert on a play, so he wasn't able to just be Gobert at the rim. Again, these these are a couple little plays here and there. In general, it felt like, especially later on in the game, it looked like the Suns were overwhelmed. It looked like they had no idea what to do on offense. They, They looked like they didn't have anything reliable to go to, and so it just became like, I don't know, KD shoot a pull up 17 foot or whatever. Funny enough, he actually made a couple of those in the fourth quarter. That, that's not the point. The point is they didn't know what the hell to do against the elite Wolves defense. Okay, now we go to Pacers Bucks. Um, now I was not able to see the whole game because there were three games on tonight, and so it was just I'm gonna watch all of Suns Wolves catch basically second half of the third into the fourth of Pacers Bucks until it becomes a blow, and then we go to Clippers Mavs. So okay, what I did see was the Pacers getting some buckets. Saw two Siakam fadeaway two-pointers over Crowder. Another one where he just, like, got behind the defense off of a transition opportunity. Where he gets the assist from TJ. We got a couple of Miles Turner threes where, like, Siakam's drawing two. Bobby Portis is helping over. That's a corner three. Another time where Turner's spaced out. Brooke has got to close out to him. And, I mean, we know that Brooke doesn't want to do that. Even if, I mean, his closeout was okay, but it wasn't great. That was after, like, TJ pushed it to where Brooke had to, like, worry about him in the middle of the floor for a second. Uh, Miles also had a pick and pop two pointer over Brooke. We had a very weird five second violation on an inbound by Chris Middleton, if I saw that correctly, because I I was doing something at the same time. But I believe that's what happened. But hey, Dame still dropped thirty four, so you got that going for you. The feeling that I get with the no Giannis books is that like Brooke makes six threes in that game. They are desperate for one of those types of performances in each of these games if Giannis is not. Team needs players to score points. Very big take by me. But as I say that, like, I think it's fair to wonder if Halliburton can be like a 20-point scorer for the rest of the series, just given how it's gone so far, you know? The passes are still there. I mean, the first play I saw was like Halliburton, Turner, within the three-point line screen, they bring two to him, and then it's a flip to, or like a jump pass to Turner for a three-point play. Again, I was not able to watch the whole game. But what I will say from just looking at some of Siakam's buckets, I mean, it's like a mix of things. It's like a back down on Bobby Portis, or it's like he catches it on the wing with Brooke uh, being matched up on him, so then he's going off the dribble, or he's cutting at the same time a screen with Halliburton and Turner's happening on the other side of the floor. So it's a mix of ways that Siakam is killing the books right now. And the next time they play is on Friday at 5.30 my time, which is like the weirdest time of all time, but I'll be able to actually watch that game from beginning to end, so that's cool.